This video is designed to educate you about your upcoming surgery. After this video, your surgeon or an assistant will be happy to answer any additional questions you may have. You will also be asked to sign a consent form that gives your surgeon permission to perform the surgery. The removal of one half of the thyroid gland, also known as a hemithyroidectomy or a thyroid lobectomy, is recommended for two main reasons. The first is when there is a growth in one of the lobes of the thyroid gland that is increasing in size. The second is when a biopsy or tissue sampling of the growth contains cells that are concerning and the results of the fine needle aspiration biopsy cannot provide an accurate diagnosis. The only way that the true nature of these growths can be determined is by the removal of the growth and examining it in its entirety under the microscope. How is the surgery performed? Your surgeon will discuss some of the specific details about your operation with you, such as the location and size of the incision. In addition, the specifics regarding wound closure and care for your wound will be reviewed in detail. What is the difference between examining the entire tumor versus the cells that are obtained by fine needle aspiration? In a fine needle aspiration biopsy, a needle is inserted into the growth and either individual cells or clusters of cells are drawn up into the needle and syringe. The cells are then placed onto a glass slide and examined under the microscope. In a frozen section performed during the surgery, as well as the final pathology assessment, the tumor is cut into sections so that the entire architecture of the tumor can be examined. In addition, this provides an opportunity to examine a much larger population of cells that cannot be accomplished in the fine needle aspiration biopsy. This more detailed evaluation includes an examination of the capsule of the tumor. When the tumor cells have grown into or through the capsule, it is called capsular invasion. In tumors that have been defined as follicular tumors, the only way to distinguish benign, known as an adenoma, from malignant, known as follicular carcinoma, is by identifying whether capsular invasion is present or whether there is evidence of cancer cells growing into blood vessels within the tumor, known as vascular invasion. The presence of capsular and vascular invasion cannot be made by looking at individual cells or clusters of cells on a fine needle aspiration. What is a frozen section diagnosis and how does it differ from the final pathology assessment? Frozen section analysis is performed during the surgery and involves the immediate assessment of the tumor. The intent of a frozen section analysis is to diagnose the types of cells that are making up the nodule and to determine, in most instances, whether it is benign or malignant. Frozen sections should be performed for the purpose of making a decision about how the surgery should proceed. If the results of the frozen section will not alter the course of the surgery, then in general it should not be performed. There are limitations to the information that can be gained on frozen section compared with permanent section. While frozen section can take approximately 20 minutes, permanent section may take up to 48 to 72 hours to complete. A frozen section is performed by cutting through the thyroid nodule and placing a thin section onto a glass slide, which is examined under the microscope. The difference between a frozen section analysis and a permanent section analysis is based on the number of sections that are made through the nodule and the remainder of the thyroid gland. During a permanent section, the entire gland is cut into fine sections, which provides much more detailed information about the nodule and the remainder of the gland. In addition, special stains may be performed on permanent section. Due to the more detailed nature of the analysis during a permanent section, there is an inherent risk that the results of the frozen section may be changed when the tissue is examined during the permanent section. In most instances, pathologists are very reluctant to make a determination that a nodule is malignant on frozen section unless there is irrefutable evidence. This is because if it is diagnosed as malignant, the surgeon will perform a more extensive procedure that usually involves the removal of the entire thyroid as well as the central compartment lymph nodes. When the pathologist is not certain about the frozen section diagnosis, the surgeon will usually wait for a more definitive diagnosis on permanent section before removing the entire thyroid gland or lymph nodes. The impact of that delay is that the patient may be told in 48 to 72 hours that they indeed have thyroid cancer, which may cause the patient to need a second operation 
to have the remaining thyroid tissue removed, a procedure known as a completion thyroidectomy. Fortunately, the risk of a false positive frozen section diagnosis is extremely uncommon, which means that surgeons will not proceed with a more extensive procedure than is warranted. The risk of a false negative frozen section is usually quite low, but may vary between different medical centers. If the surgeon also removes lymph nodes surrounding the thyroid and they are determined to be malignant by frozen section, then the surgeon will know that the patient has thyroid cancer and will remove the entire thyroid gland. What are the risks of a hemithyroidectomy? The removal of one half of the thyroid gland is a very safe procedure. The risks of performing this surgery include the following. One of the most important maneuvers during a hemithyroidectomy is the identification and protection of the recurrent laryngeal nerves that supply the movement of the vocal cords. In the hands of an experienced surgeon, the risk of injury to this nerve is very small. Injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which controls the back and forth movement of the vocal cords, can cause temporary or permanent hoarseness. The severity of hoarseness may vary from patient to patient. Sometimes temporary hoarseness will last for a few days because of swelling from the breathing tube which is placed between the vocal cords during surgery. The hoarseness caused by injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve may be indistinguishable from the hoarseness caused by swelling from the breathing tube, except that the examination of the larynx will demonstrate the difference. While most injuries to the recurrent laryngeal nerves are temporary, the development of a permanent paralysis can result in a long-standing alteration in the patient's speaking voice. This can be largely corrected through a small surgical technique that involves repositioning the paralyzed vocal cord into a more favorable location under local anesthesia. This procedure can be performed by injecting material directly into the paralyzed vocal cord or by inserting material to the side of the vocal cord in order to push the vocal cord medially or towards the center of the larynx. The effect of either of these techniques can dramatically improve the quality of the patient's voice. The superior laryngeal nerve is located near the upper region of the thyroid gland and controls the tension of the vocal cords. This nerve is important because it allows you to change the pitch and the volume of your voice. Injury to this nerve will affect your ability to yell and to sing. Your surgeon will do everything possible to protect this nerve during surgery. Most people have four parathyroid glands. These glands are responsible for secreting parathyroid hormone, which controls calcium levels in your body. Only one functioning parathyroid gland is necessary to maintain normal calcium levels. Regardless, your surgeon will make every attempt to save both of the parathyroid glands located close to the thyroid lobe that is being removed. At the end of the procedure, your surgeon will evaluate the two parathyroid glands to determine if they appear to be healthy. If they do not look healthy, your surgeon may elect to perform a parathyroid autotransplantation of that gland. An autotransplantation involves the reimplantation of a parathyroid gland into an adjacent muscle where it can pick up a new blood supply. After a hemithyroidectomy, there is essentially no chance that you will experience a drop in blood calcium level because there are two functioning parathyroid glands on the opposite side of the thyroid. However, every attempt will be made to preserve both of these parathyroid glands in case future surgeries are needed, which may put the remaining parathyroid glands at risk. Thyroid surgery is performed under sterile conditions, so the risk of infection is extremely small. Swelling for several weeks after surgery is common, and you may have mild redness around the suture line on your neck. You may also experience a low-grade fever for a day or two following the procedure. If the swelling, redness, or fever persist or get worse after the first few days, you should contact your surgeon. While the risk of bleeding after your surgery is very low, it is the most important risk associated with a thyroid operation. The greatest risk of bleeding is during the first 6 to 12 hours after the surgery. However, a delayed bleed is also possible. The major concern about bleeding after a thyroid operation is the risk of compression on the airway. If you experience a sudden onset of swelling, you should either call 911 for assistance or go to the closest emergency room for treatment immediately. Only go to the emergency room if the travel time is very short and you have not experienced any breathing problems. You should not attempt to drive yourself to an emergency room 
but rather be driven there by a friend or family member. Be sure to notify your surgeon of the change in your condition. To avoid postoperative bleeding, avoid straining due to an exertion or during a bowel movement. Your surgeon will advise you to not do any exercise or lifting of any object over 10 pounds for at least a week following surgery. Your surgeon may elect to place you on a stool softener after surgery in order to avoid straining during a bowel movement. Chyle is a fluid that runs through the lymphatic vessels that travel from the gastrointestinal tract up to the neck. If these very small lymphatic vessels are interrupted, they can leak under the skin. A chyle leak is usually recognized by your surgeon during the procedure and corrected before the end of the procedure. However, in very unusual circumstances, the leak may not be recognized or the repair may not hold up. If this happens, your surgeon can insert a drain and put you on a low-fat diet. Under select circumstances, if the leak persists or is considered a high-volume leak, then it may be necessary to surgically close the duct. The risk of this complication is very small during thyroid surgery. It is more common if lymph nodes on the side of the neck have to be removed as well. Why is the entire lobe removed rather than just the nodule? Patients often ask why the surgeon needs to remove the entire lobe instead of just the nodule. This is done for nodules in the thyroid isthmus, but not usually for the two thyroid lobes. This is because there are nerves to the vocal cords which must be clearly identified and protected. Additionally, the parathyroid glands which control the secretion of parathyroid hormone are also identified and protected. If a nodulectomy is performed from the thyroid lobe, a frozen section or quick evaluation of the removed tissue during surgery under a microscope will likely be used to determine whether a complete lobectomy is necessary. As noted above, there is a risk of a false negative reading on frozen section that may require additional surgery at a later date. If that occurs, the surgeon will have to re-enter the same compartment of the neck in order to remove the remainder of the thyroid lobe. The secondary surgery places vital structures at an increased risk because of the development of scar tissue, making it harder to preserve these structures. The fundamental principle is that surgery for a nodule is safest by removal of the entire lobe in one setting. Another important point about performing a nodule excision versus the removal of the entire lobe is that if the diagnosis of cancer is established on permanent section, there may be some very helpful clues in the remainder of that lobe that may help to determine the need to remove the rest of the thyroid gland. What do you do if you have nodules in the other lobe and why not just take the entire gland? If there are nodules in the opposite lobe and they are suspicious based on ultrasound criteria, or if they are greater than one centimeter in size, then they should be biopsied. If that biopsy shows suspicious findings, then a total thyroidectomy may be required. There is no way to determine if these nodules will grow. Some patients choose to have both lobes removed to eliminate uncertainty, as well as the need for continued monitoring of that nodule. Surgeons typically prefer not to remove the opposite lobe to avoid unnecessary risk to all four parathyroid glands, as well as the risk to all four nerves that control the vocal cords. Although the procedure is very safe, there is a significant difference between a hemithyroidectomy and a total thyroidectomy with respect to the potential for hypoparathyroidism if the parathyroid glands are interrupted. In a hemithyroidectomy, only two of the parathyroid glands on the side of the lobe being removed are at risk. As a result, there is a zero risk of a drop in calcium. Alternatively, following a total thyroidectomy, there is a risk of a temporary or permanent drop in calcium. A drop in calcium that lasts for more than six to 12 months may mean that you will have to take calcium and vitamin D every day for life. Most patients who experience a drop in calcium have a temporary drop that requires that they take calcium and vitamin D replacement every day for several weeks following the operation and then be weaned off the medication. Finally, the removal of the entire thyroid gland will require that you take thyroid hormone every day to replace the function of the thyroid gland. After the removal of half of the thyroid gland, there is only a small chance of having to take thyroid hormone replacement medication. What is the likelihood of having to take thyroid hormone replacement medication with only one remaining thyroid lobe? Most patients that undergo a hemithyroidectomy do not require thyroid hormone replacement therapy. This is particularly true for younger patients. However, there is no way to predict which patients will require thyroid medication. 
In most instances, your physician will check your thyroid hormone levels two to three weeks after surgery when the function of the remaining thyroid lobe can be fully assessed. If you have any questions that are specific to your surgery or to your recovery, please feel free to ask your surgeon or one of the assistants.